And if you're wondering why I didn't answer the question about how sap moves in a tree, well, I couldn't. But it's a good point how soon to tap. It depends on the equipment you're using. If you're using a bucket or a sap sack, you have to be tapping when the sap season starts and not before. If you're, got, if you're using an airtight system with tubing, then you can tap earlier. Okay, this picture was taken at our original sugar bush after color was instituted, so it was in the 60s. Again, it's the same uh, building. We're no longer using the building. In fact, the whole thing has rotted down. If you ever have been in old sugar bushes that didn't have hoods in the evaporator, a few years of cooking syrup and pretty soon that roof starts to cave and you rebuild it a few times and pretty soon the whole thing rots down because the wood that the building's built out of doesn't like the moisture that you're giving it every year. Okay, sap buckets, if you're going to get into this system, into making maple syrup and you want to talk costs, that's what we're going to do right now. If you're buying a new metal sap bucket, and I just looked this up yesterday, $19.50 in the liter catalog. The cover for that bucket is $4. A stainless spout, if you buy the right ones, you can get for $1.85. So it's $25.35 per hole that you're drilling in the tree. If you're going with a plastic bucket, food grade, I hope, you should be able to find a new one for around $5. Put a cover on it for $2.50 and that same spout, so you've got a good system for $9.35. The cheapest way to go with a sap sack is a PVC holder. These things have been around for some time, uh, probably showed up on YouTube and Maple Trader, where somebody took a piece of PVC pipe, cut, cut it off, routered a groove into it, took the plastic bag and a zip tie and tied it and then drilled a hole. That's all that is. It's cheap and it works. Um, though that's the standard sap sack with a metal holder and the, and the plastic bag. The PVC holder you can get for a buck ready to go or you can make your own. And just be careful when you're routering that. You, is that the right word? Routering? I guess it is. Uh, that you keep your fingers away from it and you don't get them chopped off. But anyway, the holder you can buy for a buck. If you buy a polycarbonate spout, today they're 13 cents. You really should throw them away at the end of the year, but by God, that's cheap. The sap sack itself is going to be a quarter. The zip tie, because you have extra long ones and you need really tough ones, are 17 cents. So you're talking $1.55 to tap a tree. The polycarbonate spouts, the one on top, the stainless one is the one on the bottom. The stainless one will last forever, but you have to clean it, sterilize it some way between seasons. If you don't, and you put it in the tree the next year, whatever mold was on there is going to start growing right away. You need to get it clean. The plastic one, you better throw it away, and for that price, I think you can afford to do it. The metal holder, the better ones today, are 360. There are some cheaper ones on the market. Most of them actually are built in China, of all the places in the world. But um, the better ones are around 360. They're a little smoother, less chance of cutting yourself or your, your friends cutting themselves when they're taking them off the tree. The spout again is $1.85, the sap sack's a quarter, so you can start tapping trees for $5.70 as a system. Tubing and the costs involved. Yes? Yeah, just fast on the, on the sack or the buckets. Um, you don't, the, the PVC holder is open on the top. You don't want, you want a cover on it, don't you? You're absolutely right. That one is open on the top. It's not a good idea. You can go down to the hardware store and find a piece of a plumbing cap and put it on there. Adds a little bit to your cost. It's not too bad. 
If you drink a lot of soda in large bottles, you cut the bottom off and you put that on there and you'll have a cover. Not recommending you drink that much soda, but it's a good way to do it. This is one of my oldest slides, probably one of the first presentations I ever did. That is from our first system of tubing, probably put up in the 80s when it had ribs and it stretched forever, years and years and years. You'd go out and redo the tubing every year because it stretched. You'll see there's still tiny sags between the trees because there's no way to not have them there. And then after a few years, the inside diameter had gotten so small you could hardly get liquid through it. But it was better than using buckets, in my opinion. Today, we have 3 16 inch tubing and 5 16 inch tubing. The 3 16 has only been on the market a few years. There are some people right in this room having very good luck using this tubing. And it's not very expensive, actually. 3 16 tubing, you need about 25 feet between the trees, or per tree. Cost of that's going to be about $2.11. The spout, again, you want to drill a 5 16 inch hole, but it'll fit in the 3 16 inch tubing, is a quarter, and the T is 33 cents. So you got $2.69 invested if you're using a 3 16 inch tubing system. The reason it's so cheap is because you don't, generally, you don't have main lines. If you've got real steep slope, and I mean more than 10%, you can use this system, 3 16 How many trees you put on that line is still somewhat up, somewhat up for debate. Uh, Proctor has some studies out there you can get online. Cornell has some studies. It seems like 40 is a good number. Um, it's something that no one knows is the optimal number at this time. But you run 40 taps together down a steep slope and into a, a drum of some sort, it's going to cost you $269 a tap plus your drum. Plus $250 to get the drum out of the ditch. <laughs> yes, I forgot that. He says it does cost sometimes as much as $250 to get that drum out of the ditch. <laughs> Okay, if you're going to use 5 16 inch tubing, which, do you have a question? Yeah, do you have, when you start using tubing, do you have to, in, what, do you have to have an opening at the top to vent that? Just Should you vent your tubing lines? My answer is 99.99 .99 times out of 100, no. But a lot of people want to do that. And the reason that I'm saying is no is because if you open it up, you're going to have a lot more air, hence a lot more bacteria growing inside the tubing. If the sap is actually moving in the tree, the tree is producing a liquid and a gas, therefore it's going to come out that little hole through the tubing and, and get actually pushed down the tubing. Plus, with this system, you're going to have vacuum pulling. Uh, if you put a hole in the end of the tubing, you're not going to have any vacuum. The vacuum pulling just because the weight of the sap? Yes. The weight of the sap in that 3 16 inch line is creating vacuum if you have a lot of slope. And by that I mean more than 10%. And you have to keep that 10% slope constant. You can't change. Okay? Okay, comparing 5 16 inch tubing, and there are lots of types of 5 16 inch tubing on the market. Some are 15 year tubings, some are 10 year tubings, some are 5 year tubings. Usually has to do with how much ultraviolet protection is in the tubing. And then it also has to do with whether the tubing has regrinds in it, which it shouldn't, but some companies are doing that and a few other things that I don't understand because I'm not the proper chemist. So for those 25 feet, if you're using standard medium-priced 5 16 inch tubing, it's going to cost you $2.75 a tap. The spout, if you're using a polycarbonate, cheapest ones on the market today, $0.17. Cents. You can go as high as $0.35, cents, but $0.17 cents ones work. The T is 29 cents, so there you got 321 
in the same amount of system before we get to the main line per tap. Now, what, does, what isn't figured there, just like the slide tells you, there's no storage figured, there's no pumps figured, there's no pump station. You know, if you just set your drum in the ditch, it sometimes is problematic. Uh, my estimate for someone coming to me to ask what it's going to cost to put up a system in materials only is ten to fifteen dollars per tap plus your storage plus your pumps if you want a good system. And that's talking about dry lines, which Eric referenced early this morning as well. Then you're definitely going to be closer to the 15. Yes? Does it generate the same vacuum as the 316? No. The question is, do you get the same vacuum there? Here you're getting almost no vacuum. You need to put a vacuum pump on it. What's, what's the lifespan of that system? At $15 a tap, how, long, how many years of production will I get out of it? I would estimate it at 10. You can stretch a little more out of it, but 10 is a good number to use when you're planning. But your, your tanks and your pumps should still be okay, correct? They should last forever okay. if you use them properly and don't do something stupid. Is the, um, the, the pump listed on there, is that the pump for the vacuum? Um, or is that a pump to pump the sap to a... Is that a vacuum pump or a pressure pump? The answer is yes. It's not figured. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I guess, so the question I have is, would you have a kind of... What kind of pump would you recommend if I'm driving a trailer around with a collection bin to collect out of other barrels? What kind of pump would I recommend to pull sap out of barrels into yeah. a tank on your four-wheeler right, or that, whatever? Um, there are battery operated pumps that are very effective today. You know, if you go with a gasoline powered pump in that instance, like we've had to use in the past, you end up with a quite a bit of weight that you're carrying around. So I guess because you're not moving at any large distance, you could get a little battery operated pump to move that. If you have to suck it, if you can't just push it, then you should look at a diaphragm pump because they will suck and push. And they can be operated you know, with any kind of power, whether it's electric, power, electric gas, or, or battery. How about a barrel pump? Is there a barrel, a barrel pump? A barrel pump as in, propane, or as in an oil barrel type pump you're yeah, like talking? You A bilge pump, it's called, right? You can find them made out of plastic, and, and if you look hard, you can find a food grade one that you can operate that way. Yes, and you have to have a lot of, lot of uh, built-in em employees. Yeah, yeah, okay. Okay, a little bit more about tubing when you're setting up the system, and I'm not going to talk a long time about this, but this is the top end of the tubing line, whether it's 5 16 or 3 16 You want a nice fitting, and this is my favorite on the market. You see it just clips onto the line. It also acts as your T, and this part goes up to the hole. This is the spout in the off season where it's plugged back so critters can't crawl in. Mud wasp and those fun things. But that particular fitting um, just clips on. So if you need to take that line down for woods improvement or for whatever reason, it just unhooks. It's so simple. All the other fittings on the market you have to cut off. And once you cut them, you score the barbs and you'll never get a good seal again. At the main line, you do not want to hook the 5 16 directly into the manifold. You always want to use a fitting that hooks onto the wire and then to take the tension off of the manifold and then just put a little loop. 
And there are a couple of fittings that do this. One is a connector with a hook, which I'm showing here. And there's also another fitting that actually slides over the tubing, clamps on, and then hooks onto the wire. That one costs a little more, but you're not cutting the tubing one more time and spending extra time putting it together. So it just works way, way easier. There's the little connector. Eric showed you a system and a way to put a dry line into the wet lines, the bottom lines. We like to enhance the, the difference. So the black line is the dry line, which generally isn't holding sap, so we can use black there. It isn't warming up our sap. The blue line is the main line for the liquid, which I use blue all the time. I do not use black anymore. My first system, blue was not available. I used black. Because of using black, I lost one grade. And it took me a lot of years to figure out what was wrong. But that black stuff really heats up the tubing, or heats up the sap. And when the sap would be coming in, on a cool day, it felt like bath water. And on a sunny day, it was warm. Well, you can imagine what happens with bacteria with sap like that. So uh, by eliminating the black line and putting in blue line, I raised my, my quality of full grade. But back to dry line and wet line, we like to actually make that dry line go up a ways before it connects in. And you get less transfer of liquid into the dry line if you do that. If it's really close, you know, if I just hook tight together here uh, with the valves, uh, you get a little more liquid up in this line. It's not the worst thing in the world, but it's, it's just something that we like to do. We've got shims underneath that tape over, so they're almost... Yeah, um, you're right. We've got shims around there. That's treated wood with wire, and that's connecting this secondary main line. I don't use anchors in the trees like Eric does. Um, it's okay, he left. Okay. He has to go upstairs now. Oh, darn. Um, to me, this is a lot less invasive, and this is a crop tree. This is a very good, healthy maple tree. If it was a junk tree, I wouldn't be worried, and I'd put that anchor in it. But this, I can move every few years, and I'm not doing harm to the tree. No, they're just held there with tension. I do put vacuum gauges throughout the forest. Um, so because there's someone out there all the time when the sap's running, checking for leaks and doing repairs, if he can look at a gauge, it helps him, to, him or her, but it's usually a him to know that whether there's a problem above that particular gauge or not. Uh, the line going straight up is for a computer monitored system. So uh, we can tell with our computers if we've got a problem out in the woods and approximately where it is. And as expensive as those systems are, last year one late afternoon when the sap had stopped running, check the computers in the various pump stations, uh, and one was down. And a fellow went and checked it, made the repairs. That night was one of our best runs. Had that whole pump station been down, we, we would have lost all that sap out of that pump station. That, sa cost, that saved us enough to pay for this whole computer system to monitor our sugar bush. Is that wireless, Joe? Yes. Oh, absolutely. This is up year round. How do you clean it if it's never been How do you clean it? Well, um, it's easier than washing buckets, but it takes a lot of walking. And there are two ways to clean. One, you carry solution on your back and actually suck a little bit through each spout when the vacuum is on. 
I've always preferred doing it with pressure from the bottom. Mix up a solution, mostly water. I prefer using what I call tubing cleaner and it's sold that way. The active ingredient is phosphoric acid and then there's a few other minor ingredients there, all food grade. If you mix that with air and then push it through the system, you get a scrubbing action as well as a sanitizing action. And yes, it's a lot of work, but what cell walls of mold are, is not removed, and most of it is removed, not all of it, it'll at least kill it. Uh, it's easier when it's when you don't have this much set up, actually. Do you have to reposition a tap every year, or you just suck out of the same hole? No, you have to re-drill every year. As soon as season's over, we wash immediately, and by each tree as you walk to it, you're pulling the spout out, clip it back on the tee like I showed on one of those previous slides. That's where it stays so the tree can heal. Then the next year we come and we move over between four and six inches and go up or down so we're not, you know, creating a... Can you eventually go around the whole tree and then yes. it's done? Because you well, no. As you come back around, the tree has grown so much that then you can actually go between those old wounds. There's plenty of fresh wood. You don't want to go right over it, but you can get in between again and you can go forever because you haven't overtapped. Okay, what we have here is, um, I'm standing on a, a, what I call a road, it's a logging trail, and we wanted to go under the road, so we have culvert there. We come under with a few lines, and, we, and then we come up. We put in this collector, the black lines are vacuum, going two different directions. The blue lines are the wet lines. And then you also see there's some, ladder, some uh, yeah, laterals coming in to the wet lines as well. It looks a lot more complicated than it really is. Again, we are using treated wood around our crop trees. We have probably more problems with bear than we do with anything else. Deer can see this and it doesn't bother them. They go under, over, the deer are still there. The bear, generally when they come out of hibernation in spring, they cause a problem. And usually that's at end of season, although it can be during season if you have a real warm period. And typically what they do is they just kind of bite you know, it looks like a garden sprinkler hose when they're done as, as they walk along. Occasionally, if it's a place where they want to walk a lot, they'll just put it in their mouth and keep on walking. Um, do they like the, do you have any sap spill? Do they, do they like the, a little bit of sweetness from that? Well, that's probably what they're looking for, the sweetness, but there is none there because the vacuum's always on. So there's, there's really nothing there. I'm sure they're just more curious than anything. Do you, do you adjust your trails like due to incidents and stuff like that? Do I adjust the trails? I mean, do you pass reroute the tubing? Well, uh, we try to route the tubing. First off, you have to use the natural gradation of the land. And where we are, it's quite flat. We don't have your billy goat hills like you folks have. Um, as you can see, um, but we, we use this, the slope we have and then we look at where the existing trails are and try not to cross them any more times than we have to. Yes? Um, how do you keep it from like, not freezing if, you, uh, if it gets really cold in during the season? How do you keep it from not freezing? You can keep it from not freezing. But what we do is we have our vacuum pumps on until it's way below freezing temperature. Freezing temperature is 32, right? 
Sometimes sap will actually run below that temperature. It's really strange. But, so we'll leave our pumps on at least till 28, sometimes 25. And then the same thing with turning them on. We turn them on before the sap starts running in the morning. So the lines are, are relatively empty all the time. So they only run during the main sap flowing cycle. The, the pumps, pumps? Well, I guess it depends on how you define all the time. During season, if it's above 25 or 28 degrees, the pumps are on. They're all electric pumps. Now, when, it, when it gets down into the low 20s at night, then, it's a then we shut them off. Yeah. Do you have a question? Mm -hmm. The question is, again, and, and it's a good question, when is the time to tap? Because of the business that I have, I have people calling me from all over the Maple region asking this very question every year, and sometimes it's every day. And a lot of times the customer won't even tell me where they are, and I'm supposed to tell them when to go tap. My answer to you and to those folks is, do a signal tree or two. Go out into your woods and tap one or two, hang a bucket or bag on it, bag so you can see what's happening, and just watch what's happening. Then you'll know if it's time in your woods. Yes? How much more surf do you normally get with a vacuum system than say like with a bucket for a tap? Normal production between vacuum and non-vacuum. Well, first off, who knows what normal is? But having said that, and watching my customers not using vacuum, back up. When I was a kid, when I was first getting into this business with my dad, we used all those buckets I told you, 6,200. We had a wood-fired evaporator. It was long before ROs ever came into this industry. I mean, you know, everything was done the old-fashioned way, as you saw in that picture. We had a year when we made a half a gallon of sap per tap, and I probably lost almost that amount of sap because we could not keep up gathering it. It was phenomenal. 1977, I believe it was. The run was phenomenal. And the funny thing was that the maple experts, whatever they are, said this is going to be a bad year. You know, you may not want to tap. Well, the trees were, we had been in a drought and the trees were taking up the moisture and that's why we had the phenomenal runs. But normally in the past, you would get that quart of syrup per tap under non-vacuum system. It's been a long time since I've seen that happen. My customers that are tapping trees without vacuum are ending up with one run a season and a couple, what do you call them, dribbles, you know, very little sap, and they're not having good seasons. Those of us with good vacuum are overcoming, overcoming whatever that issue is that's out there, and we're ending up with in my own bush, we're making a third of a gallon of syrup per tap almost every year. And that's even after we're tapping the baby trees, you know, that you should, probably shouldn't be tapping. So, how do I answer that question truthfully? Years ago, people would say you can double your production if you put vacuum on. And I always said, watch out, because occasionally you can, but I know a lot of times it won't be that good, yet recently it seems like it's even better. Part of that's because we have better technology, better pieces of equipment, the fittings fit better, the tubing fits better, our knowledge is better of how to use it, but there's also something happening different in our environment that we don't understand at all. So do you sterilize the holes? Do I sterilize the holes? Not anymore. 
we did for a while using food grade alcohol. Don't want to use anything non-food in the United States. Uh, food grade alcohol, by the way, is cheap vodka. <laughs> <laughs> and it works wonderfully. Um, but it seems that all that's doing is starting the drying process, which I know isn't really drying, it's healing. So there's really no purpose as long as your drill bit is clean and sterile. So once in a while it's a good idea to actually sterilize your drill bit, but I wouldn't worry about the hole. Does the flavor of sap change by the soil that you're using? Does the flavor of sap change by the soil? Well, I know the syrup changes by the soil, definitely. As a buyer of bulk syrup, I can often tell what part of the state it's coming from by the flavor. I don't know about the sap. How do you clean the hole? How do I clean the hole in the tree? That you drilled. Before I put in the spout? Uh, sometimes you have shavings there. That's a sign of a poor drill bit if there's shavings there. A really good but pricey drill bit will remove them. Uh, you shouldn't blow in it, which everybody wants to do because you're putting bacteria there immediately. Probably the best thing is to take a piece of brush, break off a twig and stick it in there and dig it out with that. Canned air, like you use to clean a computer? Canned air. I have no idea what's in it, so I don't want to answer that, but I bet you it's effective. <laughs> Does the bacteria get killed? Absolutely right. But the problem is it's growing all the time in between coming out of the tree and getting boiled. And how fast it's growing depends on the temperature. Pump stations. Now this one belongs to my brother and he's tapping some of the original property that you know, it was in the family. And if you look closely, it's uh, sawed logs, sawed on three sides, then, then there's a, you know, a groove sawed in there, so then they're hooked together with a little piece of wood in between each log. I mean, some people would like to live in something like this, but it makes a really cool pump station. This is the newest one for my brother, again, brother and his son. Um, they tapped about 40 acres. It all ran down to that first station. Well, you know, everything was good and everything was working fine. And they bought my old reverse osmosis machine. And then we upgraded it so they had more membranes. And now they didn't have enough sap to cook. Typical problem for maple syrup people. We never get the equipment and the number of trees just right. So they had to go buy some more property that was next and tap some more trees. But that came in down towards that first pump station, but it was a little bit lower. So there's a couple of ways to attack that. And one is to put in a sap lift, and they're in the books. The problem with those, if anything goes wrong, the whole system is down. So what they did instead was build another pump station this one's smaller because it doesn't need any storage. It's just going to have the receiver, the vacuum pump, and from there then the sap will be just pumped across a little creek about 20 feet to the next pump station and then all pumped up to the SERP house together. This is the receiver I, I just referenced. Again, there's lots of styles. But if you've got a high quality vacuum pump, you cannot run sap through that vacuum pump. You will destroy it. So you have to use a receiver or extractor. Those two words mean the same thing. Hook the vacuum onto the top of the unit, way up there. And your lines are coming in from the woods with the sap back here into the manifold. Sap runs into the first tank. When that fills up, the float trips, this opens up, sap falls in the tank below while this one is filling. Same thing over there, I think you got that figured out. 
Um, here is one type of vacuum pump, a different style of extractor. Depends on how many taps you're going to put in as to what type of vacuum pump you want, also how much money you have to invest. The Bush Mink Claw Pump, Eric referenced earlier, is ideal. It's quiet. It uses air to cool. It's the nicest pump on the market for creating vacuum and the most expensive. Uh, then there's liquid-cooled vacuum pumps. They work extremely well, but you have to cool them with some sort of liquid that constantly flowing through the pump. As that liquid warms up, you get less vacuum. So if you have a source of running water, that's ideal. Otherwise, put a series of tanks and run the water through them like a radiator. Yes? What's something like this called, the pump? The first one you mentioned and, and this other one, what do they cost on average? Okay, what is the average cost? The bush pumps, I'm, I'm thinking they're starting out around 5,000. Uh, this one, and I'm not sure the size, but the smallest ones of that style are around 2,000. There are cheaper ways to go. If you don't have many taps, say you have 400, 800 taps, and you want to put vacuum on it, or less. There are diaphragm pumps that will create vacuum, push sap also. And you can buy them with either electric motor or a gas motor. For a small system, they work just great. Um, they don't have much volume of vacuum, so you have to have a perfect system, which you should anyway. But you can get started then for under a thousand. You know, that uh, 400 electric is way under a thousand, and I don't have the number in my head. The gas powered one that'll handle up to 1800, that price is at 1600. But it's your vacuum pump as well as your extractor. You don't need an extractor with that type of pump. Sap can go through it. Now, most of our people in our industry want to use their forest for more than one thing. And a few people like to hunt. This is the same brother that built a, a tree stand for his son and his granddaughters. Now, you'll notice it's not only got propane down here for a heater, it's got windows and doors, it doesn't have a ladder, it has a stairway, it has a deer crossing sign because, you know, the deer need to know. It has a satellite dish, not that there is a TV. It has a mailbox, and if you look real close, there's what he calls a beer. It's a cutout bear with antlers, just so they get the hint. And the real irony is I had him, my brother, take me out Wednesday to take this photo so I could show it today. As we pulled up on the four-wheeler, there was a deer standing, forked buck. And it just stood there and looked at us. And Ron was just going, oh my, oh my. I've been working out here all this time with my crossbow. Today I don't have it. <laughs> the deer was on the edge of the trail. Then it walked a few feet forward and stood in the middle of the path and just looked at us. And it was, you know, like 100 feet from us. Eventually walked away. So finally, and, you know, he was talking about this two days later. And I said, so you think you'll find that deer again? No, I saw my deer for the season. This is uh, our operation. On the right is where the actual syrup cooking is being done. Uh, the evaporator is in there. You see the stack and the steam. And then this is where we do the canning of the syrup and the sales of equipment on that side. And it's at the end of the road by the trees. A lot of people get scared, I guess the word is scared, when they're trying to find us because, my goodness, who would do a business out here? Well, that's where the trees are. If you want to contact me with any questions, 
There's an email address, and I'm at Maple Hollow, Merrill, Wisconsin. Thank <music> you.